here to dive into industry trends with leading ETF experts. This is ETF Spotlight with Nina Mishra. Hello and welcome to ETF Spotlight. I'm your host, Nina Mishra. My guest today is John Katsunas, Managing Partner at Breakwave Advisors. So we are talking about the shipping industry today, and uh, we'll also talk about uh, shipping ETFs that uh, Breakwave has launched uh, in partnership with ETF MG. John, welcome back. Great to have you on the show. Hi, Nina. Thank you, and uh, great to be back. So we had you on the show in 2021 when the shipping industry was very, very different. So container shipping rates had surged because all the supply chain disruptions around the world caused by the pandemic. And your ETF B drive was, in fact, the best performing ETF then. Uh, it was the top performing ETF of 2021, up more than 200 percent. And we we were hearing about stories of hundreds of vessels lined up on some of the popular coasts and all that. And the situation is very different now uh, because the demand for goods has plunged because of rising inflation. And we have also seen the shifting of spending from goods to services. So I read that shipping rates have fallen back to pre-pandemic levels and uh, some experts have called it a freight recession a shipping shipping recession so let's start with the current state of the global shipping industry are there any segments which are doing better than others in general what is the state of the industry the broader industry and the the various segments yeah that's a very good uh, summary of what has happened um, in the last uh, several years and i think like uh, uh, what is very interesting is that uh, at the start of the pandemic, if you were to ask um, most uh, shipping executives out there what the outlook uh, would be, um, they would be very, very negative. And yet, uh, shipping proved to be one of the best performing sectors during um, you know this time. Um, it's, it, it is not unusual, I would say, for shipping to perform well during periods of uncertainty or during periods of uh, significant um, uh, changes in trading patterns in the economy, when there is disruptions, um, wars, and so on. But, uh, you know, it's something that's very unpredictable. And I think at the beginning of the pandemic, as I said, very few people would have predicted this type of booming times for shipping. I think, uh, however, uh, at the peak of the cycle, or you know, a year or a year and a half ago, I would think that it was it would be much easier to to predict a correction down to call it mid-cycle levels, because um, you know, shipping as a whole is a very cyclical industry, and uh, yeah, we went to very high levels and uh, very profitable levels for many shipping companies, but at the end of the day, it's all about supply and demand and. Um, there were several reasons that drove us to th th those very high um, rates, but uh, these reasons tend to, to disappear and return back to normal. And I think that's what has been happening over the last uh, year, year and a half. So, um, you know, it is uh, both supply and demand that is driving rates, but I would say that the last, um, you know, two or three years, it has been more of a supply story. And the supply story is exactly what you described before. There were um, lines of hundreds of vessels waiting outside ports to load or unload because of the COVID restrictions, because of um, disruptions in uh, our everyday life. And that affected also shipping, whether it's like loading a container or unloading an oil tanker, um, you know, uh, vessels had to wait and, um, you know, maybe wait for days or weeks to do that. And that took a lot of ships out of the market. And that means the few ships that remained in the market, they would uh, dictate higher and higher rates. And that's what happened. Now, once all this disruption and um, COVID-related restrictions went away, suddenly all these ships are basically released back to the market. Um, at the same time, is what you described. The economy, the global economy moved from a goods economy that everybody was ordering, 
sitting on the couch, uh, you know, in a period of lockdowns, to a service economy that now everybody wants to go out there and go and travel or go and eat or go and enjoy, call it um, life back. But um, that means a shift in consumer preferences back to services and away from goods. And at the end of the day, transportation is about moving um, goods. And once the demand kind of like slows down, that is affecting overall shipping. So, you know, it, it has been a story of supply and demand, uh, but both of these moved uh, has been moving the opposite way. Um, against what we experienced in the 2021 uh, period. Um, so all segments have been affected. I would say that um, uh, the most affected one is the container segment, which is basically the segment that moves consumer goods from, um, from you know, TVs and furniture all the way to clothing. I think that was the most, um, the, the one that benefited the most during the pandemic. And that's the one that have seen the most significant deterioration in freight rates. And then you have the other two segments in shipping, which is the tankers that move oil, which actually, um, again, due to unforeseen events, has seen uh, a lot of volatility due to the war in uh, between Russia and Ukraine. And then uh, you have the drivel goods, which is very China focused. And that um, reflects more of what's happening uh, in China in terms of economic growth. Um, and I guess we can talk about all these different segments in more detail, but um, that's how I would summarize basically today the state of the shipping industry. That's a very interesting uh, summary. And you talked about supply and demand. So I also read that uh, because these companies, particularly container shipping companies, they made a lot of money in the past two, three years. In fact, I read that they made more money in three years than in the previous six decades. So and a lot of them spent that money on buying new ships. So is that another reason for oversupply? Are uh, those new ships being idled now? In general, how are these companies dealing with this plunge in demand and declining uh, transport volumes? That's a very good question. I think like um, indeed um, a lot of what you describe has been happening. However, the the shipping industry is a very slow moving industry and when you talk about new vessel supply building new ships bringing your supply to the market that's a multi-year process so yes these companies have been extremely profitable in the last couple of years and they have been ordering new ships uh, for sure i don't think that um, this is the main reason for the plunge in rates however over the next um, you know, decade or so, the effect of this oversupply of ships that are coming to the market uh, gradually could very well be um, a very, uh, you know, a big headwind for the industry um, down the line. I don't think that you're gonna see that, uh, that impact uh, today or this year, but over the next few years, as the ships get delivered, indeed, you're gonna have this wall of new ships coming to the market and unless demand really, you know, increases significantly, which is something that, you know, at the end of the day, shipping demand is uh, basically economic growth. And I don't think that there is any forecast out there for a significant pickup in economic growth uh, beyond, let's say, the trend lines. So I think that's that's definitely an issue. Uh, on the other hand, you know, that that is shipping. You know, you go through periods, of maybe decades of very low rates where you barely make money. And suddenly something happens. This time was COVID in 2004, 2008. It was basically Chinese growth. But during periods, uh, short term, short periods of time, you make a lot of money, which will be, be able to sustain you, um, you know, during the down cycle. And probably that's what's going to happen here. Uh, these companies have, let, have a lot of cash to survive for many, many years, even if rates are very, very low. So you talked about uh, one of the segments, tanker shipping, and I read an interesting story in the Wall Street Journal recently, and that was talking about the impact of uh, sanction on Russian oil. And uh, basically the article talked about how shipping companies have been able to sell their old vessels at high prices because Greek and Chinese shipping companies, they want to buy them in order to participate in 
the Russian oil trade. And uh, there was uh, there are some concerns about uh, security to international maritime organization had warned about this dangerous practice of ship to ship transfers in open ocean and uh, methods being used to obscure ship identities, etc. So could you talk about uh, those uh, those practices, what is going on and what is the impact of sanctions on Russian oil? So during periods of uncertainty and especially high uncertainty, um, geopolitical changes and of course wars, historically shipping has been an industry that has benefited the most. Uh, reason being that you know, trade doesn't stop. It just becomes more restricted for whatever reasons. It becomes more difficult. And that means pricing power for the brave ones that are willing to 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 take the risk of taking their ship in a in a in a war zone or in an area where is you know insurance is high, is difficult to access and so on, they can reap the benefit of that. This time around, the same thing happened. Indeed, you have the war in, um, between Russia and Ukraine. You had the significant sanctions coming from the West. And um, that affected a lot of shipping companies that either are based in Europe, the US, or the Western world, or were not willing to take the risk of um, breaking the sanctions. And again, I would say that loosely because at the end of the day, the sanctions are not against the shipping companies per se, but is against exporting uh, Russian oil and oil products. Now, in this world, there is always ways to go around these things um, as long as you understand the risk that such moves um, you know, apply, right? So there were companies that are not based in the Western world or um, they are based and they're willing to take the risk of transporting Russian oil and finding buyers or doing this, you know, oil uh, um, ship to ship transfers or putting it through a pipeline where at the end of the pipeline, you don't really know um, what type of oil it is. There were a lot of ways that you can kind of wash out the sanctioned oil um, and make and make that basically available to the market. Um, as I said at the beginning, it's not um, the actual ships that were sanctioned, but it was the the oil. So what happened was that the global tanker fleet was split into two types of ships, the ships that were able or willing to go and load Russian oil and oil products and the ones that um, are not. And the ones that are willing to do that, they are paying the premium. Now, obviously, there is no free lunch in this world and we'll see what happens, but um, probably a ship that loads uh, Russian oil uh, won't be able to go to the U.S. And, road and load U.S. oil, for example. On the other hand, insurance, as it relates to the ships, becomes more expensive and more difficult to obtain because a lot of the insurance companies are not willing to insure ships that are calling into Russian ports or loading Russian oil. So there are a lot of like, um, you know, issues around that. But what has happened is exactly that. And the effect on that on tanker rates for the non let's say, um, uh, Russian loading ships has been equally beneficial because now you have less ships in the market able to transact in the in the rest of the world, right? Uh, moving like uh, US oil or uh, Middle Eastern oil. And as a result, rates for the ships have also increased. So uh, it has been obviously a beneficial one to the ones, to the, to the, to the brave ones that are willing to go to the war zone and load Russian oil but it has been equal beneficial to the ones that are just doing the day-to-day -day transportation of crude oil as it was before. And, um, you know, these things tend to normalize because all these disruptions find a way by itself to become more efficient and at the end of the day, cheaper for the traders. And yes, indeed, rates are off the all-time highs. They're still very strong for the tanker market, but um, they are nowhere close to where it was, let's say, um, this time last year. So let's talk about uh, the transition to low or no carbon fuels, uh, because we have seen a growing focus on sustainability in the shipping industry as in other industry as well. And in fact, the UN has mandated shipping to reduce carbon intensity by 40% by 2030 and by 70% by 2050. 
safety. And I read that there's a new rule which is coming into effect that will require ships to go slower in order to reduce their carbon emissions. So could you talk about the recent developments and what strategies are being taken to cut emissions? And these are very accurate comments of what's happening today in terms of um, the decarbonization of the shipping industry. Indeed, there are a lot of initiatives out there uh, to find a solution to bring these emissions down to the targets you previously mentioned. Um, the easiest way to do it is exactly what you said, slow down the global fleet, because as you slow down ships, the amount of um, emissions all, all also goes proportionally down. So the easiest way to do it, uh, other than finding new fuels or new technologies, is just to just you know drop the whole fleet by a couple of knots per uh, uh, per hour, and that's going to basically uh, make it uh, more efficient, at least more fuel efficient. However, there are a lot of other uh, initiatives down the line that, in the long term, probably is going to is going to provide a more sustainable solution. One obviously has to do with uh, new fuels. You have to find the fuel that is less carbon intensive compared to like uh, the fuel oil that today the ships are burning. And, you know, there are a couple of ideas out there. Nothing really set in stone yet because um, it's more of like uh, the chicken and the egg. Can you actually build the infrastructure to burn a new fuel that is not available today? Uh, at the same time, do you have enough ships that are going to go that way? So to make it an economically profitable pr proposition. So today, probably you have uh, two competing technologies or two, two competing fuels, I would say, that um, is, are, look the most promising. And nobody knows if that's going to end up being the case 10 or 15 years down the road. But one is basically ammonia, which is totally a new fuel, doesn't really exist as a, a significant amount of fuel today. Um, and the other is methanol. And I think um, you know both of these are have the pros and the cons. It's a very long-term process. There are um, owners, ship owners out there that are willing to take the risk and put an order for a new ship that builds either of these two fuels, and hoping that that's going to be the technology down the road. Um, but I think that the, most of the industry is in a wait and see mode. Uh, they are not willing to take this risk. It involves a significant uh, capital outlay up front with a lot of uncertainty if that's going to be the technology of the future. And, um, you know, as I said uh, at the beginning, the easiest way to actually comply with regulations is just to slow down your ship. And this way you're going to have less emissions and you're going to comply with regulations up to the point where you have more certainty about the, the fuel of the future. So I also wanted to talk about your outlook for the industry in the second half of the year, because it's been a very tough environment uh, for the industry for the past few months. And as you mentioned, uh, shipping is prone to boom bust cycles. Uh, so do you see any prospects for recovery in the second half of the year? And uh, there's still concerns about slowdown in the global economy and uh, trade tensions with with China. So what lies ahead for the industry and uh, are there any segments within the industry that you are more positive on? Because shipping is very cyclical and goes through those um, boom and bust cycles, uh, from an investment perspective, you have to be ready to stomach um, not only the volatility, but um, the idea that you are investing at the at the very ugly part of the cycle, when things feel, um, as you said, um, very doom, doomy, and very like uh, negative, that is the right time to take this decision. Um, if you are trying, you know, to buy shipping when uh, things look great, probably you're making the wrong uh, decision because it is cyclical, and these profits won't last um, long. And we saw that last year, as I said before. So as you look at the second half of the year, um, indeed, so far um, in, the, in, in the first few months of this year, things have not been that great. I wouldn't say they have been as negative as in the previous decade when most of the companies were losing money on a daily basis. But uh, again, rates have come down to the point where most ship owners are on a break-even basis, at least 
for the dry bulk and tanker segments. On the container side, obviously, we reach back to almost money losing levels now, especially for new ships. So as you look at the second half of the year, um, the expectation of some pickup in the Chinese economy due to the, the significant stimulus that's already in the pipeline is, I think, um, a very valid argument. And if indeed that plays out and the real estate sector in China uh, picks up a bit, then probably that's going to be very positive for the steel industry. And uh, we should not forget that when you talk about dry bulk shipping, the steel industry is the main driver for demand for iron ore, which is the main ingredient to make steel. So I think the, the, the value chain here is that as demand for real estate increases, demand for steel increases, and that means China has to buy more iron ore to produce this steel. And I think that's, um, that can play out very well in the second half of the year. Um, also seasonally, the second half of the year for dry bulk is usually stronger than the first half because there is a lot of weather seasonality uh, in the construction market. So I think um, from where we stand, we can see that as a, as a more likely scenario than the opposite where you have basically a bad second half of the year. For the oil tanker market uh, and the tanker uh, shipping sector, I think you have to, to consider more about what happens with uh, Russia and Ukraine, uh, whether this conflict continues, and that will continue to, to basically put a lot of disruptions in front of uh, every ship that transports uh, oil or oil products. And that's beneficial, obviously, for, for, for the tanker market. But also you have to consider, again, economic growth and whether there is more demand for oil, whether uh, OPEC has to put more oil in the market in the second half of the year. And I think there is a lot of analysts out there that believe that this is a very likely scenario. So I think for these two segments, the second half of the year looks promising. Again, nothing compared to 2021. I don't think that uh, um, there is any predictions out there for, for such booming times. But, um, you know, in the normal uh, cycle for shipping, I think uh, we're looking at, uh, you know, a mild up cycle during the second half of the year. Let's talk about your ETFs now. And uh, last time we had you on the show, we talked about B Dry, which has which was one of the biggest beneficiaries of the unusual circumstances caused by the pandemic. And as I mentioned, it was up more than 200% then. Since then, you have launched two more ETFs, uh, BC and BVET, very interesting tickers. So tell us why you decided to launch these uh, two ETFs and uh, also tell us uh, what these ETFs do exactly. So BC is an ETF that... Um, aims at the decarbonization theme in the shipping sector. Um, it's very different from be dry and be wet because it invests in actual companies, in stocks, where be dry and be wet are futures-based ETFs. And I think like, um, um, you know, as a, as a stock ETF is very similar to the thousands of other ETFs that uh, pick up on a theme and um, you know, uh, choose uh, a basket of stocks that represent this theme. Be wet, however, is again um, much more interesting in terms of what it does, and is very similar to be dry. The difference between the two is that be dry, be dry is focused on the dry bulk sector, where be wet, which was launched two weeks ago, is focused on the tanker market. And I think, like um, for the investor who is willing to take. Um, a higher risk because both of them are higher risk products. They are more volatile than uh, your average ETF. Um, both of these ETFs offer the opportunity to invest directly into, into these two shipping sectors. So for be dry and the dry bulk sector, um, uh, the ETF will move up and down based on how shipping rates are performing more or less. And the same thing happens with be wet. Uh, rates uh, of uh, the big... Uh, Oil tankers called the very large crude carriers have also futures out there and be wet invest in these futures. So as uh, rates for these big uh, tankers uh, hopefully benefit, as I said, uh, you know, uh, from this economic growth, but also the geopolitical issues that we have around, be wet should reflect such volatility, uh, obviously both ways. Um, right now, probably we are in a lower uh, rate environment versus the last six or nine months. 
Um, we'll see how the rest of the year plays out, but uh, be wet should react um, very similar to what uh, freight rates for tankers are doing. So the two futures-based ETFs, be dry and be wet, and both have very high expense ratios, uh, 3.5% each, right? And uh, in fact, last time when we had you on the show, you had explained why the expense ratio for be dry is uh, very high uh, because of the very unique nature of the futures market. If I remember correctly, those futures are not traded on exchanges. Uh, could you explain again uh, the unique nature of those futures markets, uh, which results in very high costs of trading? Yes. Um, also, let me say that um, in the last two years, uh, a very significant change that are not related to the, to the shipping markets, uh, which is high interest rates, have benefited both ETFs. And today for both ETFs, the effective expense ratio is negative, meaning that an investor that invests on be dry or be wet actually will receive money back instead of paying for that. And I will explain why this is happening. Um, for the futures, in the futures market and for both ETFs, most of the funds that are in the ETF um, earn interest. And today, obviously, interest rates are close to 5%. Uh, so an investor by investing in these ETFs, receive this interest um, indirectly, obviously through the ETF, but it receives back, let's say, around um, a 5% type of uh, interest income. So that offsets part of the relatively high expense ratio, which for BDR is probably in the you know two and a half percent level, and for BWET based on today's assets is around three and a half percent. So actually, it's a very unique structure that these two ETFs have that very few ETFs, if any, in the market have today that actually the, the investor is benefiting from the high interest rate environment. Now, however, irrespective of that, both ETFs have relatively high expense ratios because they invest in a market that are very difficult to access for the average investor because of all the um, complications and complex structures that you have to achieve, but also the fact that most of these futures trade through voice brokering. It actually needs people to buy and sell these futures, uh, which is very different than uh, the screen trading that happens on a daily basis in all other uh, markets. Um, on top of that, obviously, uh, you know, trading commissions and clearing fees and all these things are relatively higher, uh, actually much higher than most products out there. Um, but again, uh, the expense ratio have to always uh, be related to what you're getting, right? Because uh, these are very volatile products. I mean, BDR is the most volatile ETF um, in the market out there. And at any given day, it can be up or down, you know, uh, two, three, four, five percent, which obviously offsets any idea about an annual expense ratio, uh, which in a day can be either gain or loss based on what your entry point is. So if you combine all these, I would say that, um, you know, apples to apples, um, is not uh, um, expensive per se versus what you what you are gaining exposure to, and this would be the same whether you were doing it through an ETF or you were doing it basically by yourself, which, as I said before, is almost impossible to do for an individual. So as you mentioned, these are very volatile ETFs, uh, very risky too, with very unique characteristics, very unique risks. So uh, I definitely recommend that uh, investors who understand uh, these ETFs properly, they only should use these ETFs. And there's obviously a lot of uh, high return potential too, like we saw in case of uh, B-Try. But what kind of interests have you seen in general in these products? It's, is it mainly from traders or some institutional investors? Or have you seen a lot of interest from average investors too? Yeah, so I think like uh, people talk about risk and always um, uh, think about in a negative way. But at the end of the day, um, risk comes with potential, right? I mean, if, you, if you're if you not volatile as a product, you won't be able to achieve um, way above average returns. So yes, they are risky products. But at the end of the day, for a portfolio of an investor, um, each can make their own decision of how much they allocate and what kind of return they're expecting for that. Um, I, again, as an ETF, you don't have really 
a full picture of who the investor is and what the profile might be because it's in the stock market and everything is anonymous. But I would say that um, there are a mix of um, different type of investors in our ETFs. Um, first of all, I would say probably about 80, 85% is uh, US-based investors and the rest is international. Um, and again, this is this is my personal view. We don't have really statistics on that because you cannot obtain that. And then from this, uh, I would say there is a fair amount of institutional investors that now have enough history and be dry to um, to be able to implement their own strategies, whether that's a technical strategy, um, more of a fundamental strategy, or picking like uh, you know troughs and uh, and picks in the cycle. Um, but you know, right now with five plus years going in be dry, you have enough history to do that. And then there is a, a significant amount of um, retail and individual investors that are willing to you know to to invest in these risky markets. And um, you know, obviously, uh, it has been very volatile, but I think a lot of people have made uh, significant returns over the last few years. And um, you know, again, they're trying to see if that can uh, happen again. That's all we have time for today, John. Thank you so much for joining us and for the very interesting discussion. Thank you very much, Nina, and uh, very nice to talk to you again. That was John Cardsonas, Managing Partner at Breakwave Advisors. Thanks for listening. If you like our show, please leave us a rating on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast. Also, please make sure to subscribe so that you do not miss any episode. If you have any comments, questions or suggestions, please email podcast at zax.com. This material is being provided for informational purposes only, and nothing herein constitutes investment, legal, accounting, or tax advice, or a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold a security. Do not act or rely upon the information and advice given in this podcast without seeking the services of competent and professional legal, tax, or accounting counsel. Publication and distribution of this podcast is not intended to create, and the information contained herein does not constitute an attorney-client relationship. No recommendation or advice is being given as to whether any investment or strategy is suitable for a particular investor. It should not be assumed that any investments in securities, companies, sectors, or markets identified and described were or will be profitable. All information is current as of the date herein and is subject to change without notice. Any views or opinions expressed may not reflect those of Zach's investment research as a whole.